the addiction is not the primary problem, it's an attempt to solve a problem. And then the real question is, how did the problem arise? If I ask the question, not why the addiction, but why the pain, then that leads to an examination of that person's life. And then we have an inquiry. And now it no longer becomes a shameful thing that you chose this, nor does it mean that you're stuck with it because you got this genetic problem. We get it as an adaptive response to something that happened, and we can heal that. Addiction treatment is failing, is because physicians don't understand this. They keep dealing with the effects, which is the addiction, and the behaviors, which are the effects of the addiction, but not the cause, which is the childhood distress. And the impact of childhood distress that carry into adulthood, in other words, how we stay prisoners of childhood. So an addiction is a complex psychological, physiological process, but which manifests in any behavior that a person enjoys, finds relief in, and therefore craves in the short term, but suffers negative consequences in the long term and doesn't give up despite the negative consequences. So craving, pleasure, relief in the short term, negative consequences in the long term, inability to give it up. Now notice I has said nothing about substances. I said any behavior. So it could be related to cocaine, marijuana, nicotine, alcohol, whatever. Could also be sex, gambling, internet, relationships, shopping, eating, work, extreme sports, working out, any number of uh, human activities. So I said any behavior. Now, the official definition of addiction, according to the American um, Society for Addiction Medicine, is that this is primary brain disorder. It arises in the brain largely due to genetic reasons. This is how they see it. And I say that's just not true. The other popular idea about addiction is that it's a choice that somebody makes, that people choose to be addicted, which is what the legal system is based on. Because if people are not choosing, what are we punishing them for? So I, although I think the medical definition is closer to the truth, I don't see it as it's a genetic disorder, and I don't see it as a primary brain disorder. So let me perhaps show you why, if that's okay. So I give you this definition of addiction, again, craving, relief, pleasure, short-term, negative consequence, long-term, inability to get it up. So in other words, the addiction is not the primary problem, it's an attempt to solve a problem. And then the real question is, how did the problem arise? In other words, this is where my theory is that it's always rooted in childhood trauma, mm -hmm. and that the addiction is an attempt to deal with the effects of childhood trauma, which it does temporarily, mm -hmm. while it creates even more problems in the long-term. So there's a great link between ADD and addictions, and not just because they both begin with the same three letters. Um, and I can tell you about my own ADHD. And this is where we go back to childhood again. So that tuning out, that absent-mindedness, that desire to scatter your attention all over the place, that's not a disease. They say it's an inherited disease. The hell it is. But let me give you a personal question again. If I were to become abusive towards you right now, mm -hmm. verbally or otherwise, what would be your options? Right now, the rational response, if I were to become abusive, would be for you to just uh, assert yourself, saying, don't talk to me that way. Or it would be to leave, saying, right. this interview is over. And if for some reason you had not the strength to do either of those, there's other people in the room here with us, you could ask for help. Right. But what if you couldn't escape, fight back, or seek help? Then you would shut down or tune out. Right. In other words, the tuning out is simply a defensive response on the part of the brain. Now put me back into my infancy, when my mother is so grief-stricken that I'm crying because she's in pain. The child is very open and can feel the pain and suffering going on in its immediate environment. The child is aware of its own body and can also feel the le tension, rigidity and pain in the body of the mother of anyone else he's with. If the mother is suffering, the baby suffers too. The pain never gets discharged. The organism does not develop the confidence that it can regulate itself, that things will happen the way they should, hence lack of optimism. My mother didn't abuse me. She did her best to look after me, but she was stressed, depressed, terrorized, grief-stricken. I'm picking that up as a sensitive infant. Can I fight back, change the situation, or escape? None of those. What can I do? Nothing I can do. My brain will tune out as a way of dealing with the stress. 
So I'm not talking about abuse here. I'm just talking about stress mothering or parenting. The child's brain then will tune out. When is the child's brain tuning out? When the brain is developing. So the tuning out then becomes programmed in as the default setting. And that's why ADD. So it's not an inherited disease. It's not a disease at all. It begins as a coping mechanism, which then gets programmed into the brain. And as a lot of these early coping mechanisms function, they help you in the short term create problems in the long term. And that's ADD is one of these examples. And of course, it also makes, makes you more prone to be addicted because now when you tune out, life becomes uh, less interesting. Uh, you shut down emotionally, you protect yourself. Now you feel depressed. What does depression actually mean? You said you were depressed. What does depression mean? To depress something is to push it down. What do people push down in depression? They push down their emotions. Why would they? Because the emotions are too painful. So even depression becomes as a coping mechanism. You push it down so you don't feel the pain. But then later on, that interferes with your life functioning. So it all begins as a coping mechanism and later on becomes a source of dysfunction. And all this is happening when the brain is actually developing. So these are the links I began to make, including after I was diagnosed with it. So I, and then despite the fact that a couple of my kids were diagnosed, I knew that this wasn't a genetic disease, that what it is actually is a coping mechanism uh, which got programmed into the brain. And then when I read the literature on brain development, wow, turns out the human brain is shaped by the environment and particularly by the adult-child relationships. And so it all began to make perfect sense to me. Let's go back to what I said, what you quoted me saying, not why the addiction, but why the pain. So if we understand that addiction in every case is rooted in some painful uh, internal experience, and that in, when you ask people, what does the addiction do for you? They'll say, it numbs me, it soothes the pain, it makes me feel connected with other people, it gives me a sense of control, it uh, gives me inner peace. Well, the lack of inner peace, the lack of control, the lack of connection, they're all f forms of emotional pain. If I ask the question, not why the addiction, but why the pain, then that leads to an examination of that person's life, rather than looking just at the brain chemistry. They say growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health and longevity. That's what I was saying before, that those early adaptations, like pushing down your feelings when the pushing, uh, feelings are too painful, will help you as an infant, as a young, young child, but then they cause problems later on. The tuning out that you do to, to, to protect you from the stress in your environment, if you're very sensitive, it doesn't take a lot of stress, uh, helps you and you're, but in the long term becomes a problem. That's exactly what they're saying. And then this is so crucial, and it's so crucial because they still don't teach this in medical schools, even though scientifically it's not even vaguely controversial. The human brain develops an interaction with the environment. It's not genetically programmed purely. Here's what they say. The architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior.
follow. Not some of the health learning, all the health learning. Now notice what they say. First of all, the architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth, which already means what happens in the womb already has an impact on you. So if your mother is stressed and she's got high levels of stress hormone, that's already affecting your brain development. And when you think of all the stressed pregnant women out there, no wonder we've seen so many kids in trouble. And we know from American studies, international studies, that when mothers are stressed, uh, their placenta will naturally have more cortisol and adrenaline, the stress hormone. Those kids will be more likely to have stress issues later on, abnormal stress hormone levels, even at one year of age, behavior problems, learning problems, and so on. Which tells us a lot as to why adopted kids have so many more problems. That's another issue. But the next paragraph is key. The interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by, in other words, the circuitry, the chemistry of the brain and which centers and which circuits and which systems develop and which neurochemicals will be present in what quantities depends on the early environment and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. In other words, the most important influence shaping the physiological development of the brain is the quality of parent-child relationships. Now, when parents are stressed or distracted or workaholics, like I was a, a young parent, uh, if there is instability, economic troubles, relationship troubles, unresolved trauma on the part of the parent, loving parents who are just stressed, that'll interfere with the child's brain development. That's why we're seeing so much more ADHD now, so much more autism and so much more other problems because of stress in, the f in, in, in society that affects the parenting environment. In other words, yes, there's physiological problems with the brain, but it's not a genetic issue. It's related to early experience. So when you look at brain scans of adults that are troubled brain scans, as you do in addicts, you're not just looking at the impact of addiction, you're also looking at the impact of childhood trauma and, and childhood stress. And this has been shown over and over and over and over again. So there's no separation between the physiology and the psychology. So if you come to me as an addict and you say, I got such and such, and I ask you, what does it do for you? And you say, it numbs the pain. My question is, where did you develop the pain? What happened? And then we have an inquiry. And now it no longer becomes a shameful thing that you chose this, nor does it mean that you're stuck with it because you got this generic problem. We get it as an adaptive response to something that happened, and we can heal that. The reason why addiction treatment is failing is because physicians don't understand this. They keep dealing with the effects which is the addiction and the behaviors, which are the effects of the addiction, but not the cause, which is the childhood distress. And the impact of childhood distress that carry into adulthood, in other words, how we stay prisoners of childhood. And so present methods of treatment in psychiatry in addiction medicine in childhood psychiatry deal with effects rather than causes. And this is why we're so ineffective at it.